and good evening. I'd like to welcome you to yet another edition of the Columbus Report. I'm Jason Grzgorek, giving you all the information you need to know about your district here in the fire state of Ohio. I am very fortunate to have with me tonight on tonight's show from the 28th District, Representative Jonathan Deaver. Jonathan, glad you could join us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Glad you could come on back. We have some things to discuss, of course. Quite a few things, thing, yes, sir. Things have gone yes, on. Sir. Last time we were here, we were just talking preliminary budget, but we have finally passed the biennium budget. That is correct. We have a budget. And your thoughts. We have not had anybody on since the passage. Um, there seem to be about four key points that made you say, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Governor. Uh, well, I think there was a, a couple of points that, you know, through the House and the Senate process, um, it's no secret that for me, school funding was one of the main things I ran on. Absolutely. Um, and so we had to have some sort of a, a solution in there for Sycamore and Princeton. And, um, you know, and of course, over here, I wanted to see more funding for Went Woods, which we were able to get in the final bill. Um, and then I also wanted to make sure that our other schools were held harmless. And part of that was the TPP battle. So for me, that was the primary issue and the primary issue that permeated through the 28th. And of course, I, I know we will talk later in regards to some bill passage that's coming up with school, uh, with schools and, and, and school uh, scoring, which is a great achievement in, as well. But we're also looking at things that, that Governor Kasich said things about growth and the potential of, of making sure. moving for Ohio, sure. Ohio forward using old terminology. Uh, are you finding that that's what's going to happen with this budget? I mean, we're looking at red tape dissolving and, and things moving forward. Yeah, I think on balance, I mean, anytime you do a budget, there's going to be stuff you like, some, some things you don't like. Sure. So on balance, um, you know, there's a lot of good things in there. We've provided more funding for early childhood education. We've provided more funding uh, for uh, senior services and, you know, and on and on and on. So there's more money in there taking care of the folks that need it most, the ones that need the help getting up and out. But there's also some good business policies in there as well. Uh, we've reduced income taxes for working families by 6.3%. Um, and we also found a way to reduce the costs of the providing care. One of the, one of the little secrets that people don't realize is that about 53% of our budget goes into health care. And it's with the Medicaid and with and Medicaid. That's right, and it is the largest driver of our budget. And when you think about K through 12 education, you really care about education, and I do. I believe that education, um, as a as a business owner, I consume their product, sure. and we have to have the best product that we can have. And if healthcare costs continue to increase, the next the next stack in our budget is K through 12. And we're not going to shut our prisons down, and that's the next stack. <laughs> so we have to look at how we can find some good um, measures within that, that space to make things more efficient and also give some consumers some choice on cost. And, and do you think that, uh, I think you make a good point there, you know, giving that choice. Uh, do you think that this budget's going to help in doing that, or do you think there's still a little bit of help that we could we There's could a lot give? more that we need to do. Sure. I think this budget is a giant leap in the right direction in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now when you go to the hospital, you don't really have a choice in what the cost of care is. Um, you can go down <laughs> to CVS and you can bargain shop amongst the aspirin, but when you go to uh, the hospital and you're in, in their care, you know, a tablet of Tylenol is going to run you $100 in some cases. Easily, yes. Easily. And yeah. you can get an entire lifetime supply for $100 at Sam's or Costco. So I think those types of things we need to be taking a look at as far as, uh, you know, when we're asking taxpayers to foot the bill mm -hmm. and when you're talking 10,000% above retail, uh, those are some things that we need to look at in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some good cost-saving measures. We also need to make sure that everybody has some skin in the game at some level using HSAs and, and other uh, tools that we already have that are available to reduce the cost of care. Because um, after all, taxpayers are subsidizing this and it gets very expensive very quickly. Mm -hmm. We have an aging population, the baby boomers are growing up, and quite frankly, our generation, there aren't as many of us. Correct. And so we, these are just real practical concerns. So, you know, a little consumer control, a little consumer competition and price transparency is a good step. I think that's part of what's in this, this bill. Um, there's a lot more that we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Butler from the Dayton area, this has been his project for the last uh, four to six years. Uh, something that he's really passionate about, trying to find a way to, to balance the needs so we can take care of the folks that need it, mm -hmm. uh, but also provide transparency and price so people have some say in what the cost of their care is. I think if I read correctly, uh, you know, you're, you're hitting on a lot of things. That, um, Kasich also made mention that, that local governments in the, in the local areas need to start being creative, and they have been. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that this, this budget is allowing for um, the possibility, not so much of, of the return to the fund. They're, they're, I yeah. don't think we're going to see that, at least not in two years, but um, to let that creativity expand to allow for those governments to help fill their coffers any, in any way. 
Yeah, I think that's part and parcel of a, of a, of a broader conversation that has been going on for a couple of years since the governor uh, was first elected, was mm -hmm. finding ways to make the locals more efficient and effective. And whether you agree or disagree with his methods isn't really the issue. I mean, we're, we are where we are. Correct. Um, we, can't re we can't reverse it. Right, and point. I've only been here for eight months, so <laughs> it's, um, it's not like I can turn the clock back and take a look at those initial policies as part of those general assemblies. Fair. So moving forward, um, you know, I don't believe that we're ever going to get to a point where we can fully restore the local government fund, but we can provide tools and resources to local entities to have the flexibility to manage their own budgets. Um, you know, and that you know, there's a lot of arguments that we're seeing right now too in the wake of a lot of these national shootings that we're seeing, dealing with okay, well, how are we funding our local governments, and uh, what roles do we have as far as law enforcement? You know, putting money into the general fund versus having it taken care of through income tax or state state funds. So we're going to have bigger conversations moving into the next year on how we look at funding local government. It, it sounds like, again, this was a great springboard. Um, again, you saw some good points in there. Do you see that there was something missing or lacking that you would have liked to, if, if you were yeah. in his seat, where, where yeah. would you have liked to? Well, seen? I guess first I wouldn't have vetoed you know, 2017 mm -hmm. TPP <laughs> good reimbursements. Good point. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, in a budget, there's always certain things that you would like to see or not see um, in a budget. But I think on balance, considering the makeup of the General Assembly. Uh, you know, our speaker did a very good job reaching out across the aisle, working with Democrats in our, in our neck of the woods down here, so, you know, Representative Driehaus and, mm -hmm. and uh, Reese and et cetera. They had input in the budget. Their, you know, their ideas were, were taken into consideration. A lot of the things that they wanted to do were in the budget. Uh, so it was very bipartisan. I mean, the vote doesn't look as much, but right. in all reality, you know, when you're looking at the transportation budget, when you're looking at the, the general budget, a lot of the concerns of both sides were taken into consideration and, and funded. Um, uh, one of the uh, representative Barnes from the, the uh, you know, the northern part of the state, you know, a lot of the things that he wanted to work on are part of the budget so that his district's getting the things that he needs out of this budget too. So the speaker's been very sensitive to it. Uh, you can't have everything in a budget. There's limited yeah. funds, limited ability to do things. Um, and part of that is, you know, a lot of folks want to shove policy into an appropriation bill. Um, and my, quite frankly, I like policy to be fleshed out through committee. I want the sunshine on it. I want people to come in and have their input. Uh, you have always stated in, in many things in, in our debates in our last discussion that you've, you've always wanted that, that transparency, that Correct. the government should be transparent. And, Correct. And you're finding that to be a little more truthful, at least in this General Assembly? I think so. I think the, the process that's been put in place by uh, both the Speaker and Leader Strayhorn has been one to allow every representative, all 99 of us, to have our say um, in any piece of legislation or in the budget as it moves forward. I think that's very important to have um, leaders on both sides that uh, encourage and actually want the input of all of their elected members. Uh, we all come to the state house with different skill sets, sure. and so it's important in my mind that every single one of us has an opportunity to, uh, you know, vet it, research, provide input. Uh, leadership's decision is to make the decision on which way they want to go, but it's important to have everybody's feedback. Uh, you bring up bipartisanship, and that was something we discussed last time when you were here, and. Uh, the budget was one proof of that. Are you still seeing, eight months in, yeah. are you still feeling that confidence about that Well, I'll that just put well? it this way. I've had four bills go through the House so far. Um, every single one of them has been bipartisan. So I've had bipartisan uh, co-sponsors, uh, worked in joint sponsor on other bills. But we've had four go through. The one went through uh, the Ohio ABLE Act, which provides yes. the savings accounts for disabled Ohioans. Which we were going to talk about, yeah. which we can bring up here shortly, sure, but, but sure. I mean, when you look at that, it was 76 uh, members in the General Assembly. Um, on, in the House side, co-sponsored it, and 30 in the Senate. So you're talking well over 100 folks co-sponsored legislation. It was a unanimous vote in both chambers. So when it comes to taking care of people and doing the right thing and, and doing good reforms, you're seeing a lot of bipartisanship. And, and that's a good thing. I mean, I, I think you're, you're starting to see that maybe some walls are, are going down, but the, the idea that there's an, I, there is a, a, a nugget of process. There's, there yeah. is that, there's that gem, that, that diamond in the rough, so to speak, that everybody wants to go for, but why does it have to have a name or a wall protecting it, that everybody can go for it and make it happen? Yeah, I think a lot of the, you know, we see the national TV tell us that the world is non, this is hyper-partisan. <laughs> Um, and I think that, that sells good airtime probably at the national level. Sure. Uh, but D.C. is not Columbus, and Columbus is not D.C. By any means. <laughs> <laughs> stretch the imagination. And, you know, what took, you know, as an example of the ABLE Act, the joke uh, is it took them 10 years to do something we could do in six months. Um, and so that just shows you uh, how much more efficient and effective it is at the state level. 
and people want to solve problems in Ohio. I mean, it's important to, to put partisanship aside mm -hmm. when it comes to things that matter. Um, there's always part. There's a time for partisanship, and those those moments always show up. Mm -hmm. um, but by and large, I don't see that at the state house. Most folks want to work together to solve problems, um, and the partisanship issues really become an issue on who wants to impose their own theocracy on government. And quite frankly, I don't think anybody should be imposing theocracy <laughs> on government of any shape. But that seems to tend to be the the most battles that you'll see not only nationally but at the state level. Well, now that you, you've already opened the door with the ABLE Act, sure. let, let's discuss. I mean, sure. uh, this is, you're looking at uh, people who, who need, again, we're talking about people in need. Uh, this is something that you, you actually helped write for this, and one of four in the last eight months. That's pretty impressive. Well, thank you. Uh, but, they, uh, but this one, I think, someday when I'm 95 years old and I'm sitting in the nursing home, this will, be, <laughs> this will be the one. Well, I will never be able to use it because I wasn't, I, I don't have you a disability not, before true. I was 26. Uh, but I think that it will be the one thing that I can always look back on and, and, and realize that we actually did some good for folks. Um, for our, a long time, we've relegated people uh, to the shadows. If you have a disability, you can't work because our federal law says you can't have more than $600 on, on your name or $2,000 worth of assets at any given time. So we relegate people to a life of poverty. For what reason makes no sense to me. It's, it, 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 it boggles my mind. Sure. And what it does is it keeps people who have disabilities out of public view because they're, they're in group homes or they can't work so they're not allowed to participate. And quite frankly, that's something that uh, uh, it's an abomination of the way we, we should be in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're a country where we want everybody to participate. And it never made sense to me where when someone needs a little bit of help that we take away all their help if they put forth just one ounce of effort. And sure. quite frankly, I'd like them to put forth all the effort they can and then we can help them and supplement them along the way if necessary. It's a win for everybody. It, it, it's a, it it's a like win it, for the sure. community. It's a win for our taxpayers. It's a win for the individual who can have some pride in work. It's a it's a win across the board. So it's a it's a wonderful bill. And isn't it prior to to the passage of this of this bill that we are basically denying people work? And mm -hmm. here we are in, in an era that we need people working. Absolutely. Uh, I, when I gave my floor speech when we were getting through the house. Um, and, you know, I, I, I brought up the story about, uh, so every Sunday when we go to church with my boys, you just saw out, out in the yeah. lobby there, uh, they always like to go to Five Guys. So okay. we went to Five Guys up there on Mesa Montgomery Road, and that's where we like to go is to that particular one. And there was a kid there who was autistic, but he was also deaf and mute. Wow. And he, uh, his entire but job there was just to clean, and he loved it, and he was good at it, and he was friendly. Um, and if you would leave, you know, someone go use the restroom, he would follow that person and clean that whole place. It was immaculate. I mean, as much as I would hate to say it, but you could have had your, your dinner or your lunch in, in the, the restroom. restroom. It was that clean. <laughs> um, and when you would leave the table, he would clean it. There wasn't a fleck of peanut dust or anything anywhere in that place. And he was there about six, six to eight months, and then he left. And um, I noticed it and okay. went up to the manager and said, where'd he go? And he said, well, he had too much money because he didn't spend it. And they found out about it, and he lost his transportation. He was going to lose his group home, so he had to quit. <laughs> right. So okay, that, that that just doesn't okay. Right. When so you with tell this a story a, like this, it right. really puts it a, a, in it to a completely different perspective. Right. It and really so does. and so what this bill would allow him to do is put his money in this account mm -hmm. and continue to work. And so he could be a part of the business. He could be a part of the community. And you know, it, it's a good thing to have folks like that out in our community. Um, I think it's really easy to uh, you know. A lot of our phobias and a lot of our paranoias come from not interacting with people who are different than us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good thing to include him in that business. The business owner was sad, obviously. He obviously. lost one of his best employees. Sure. And so now this boy has an opportunity to come back and work for that company again. Uh, you, you brought up fear. Do you think that was one of the driving factors that, that a bill like this never came into existence? That the unknown and that, I don't that, think so. I, okay. I think it's uh, it's the unintended consequences uh, of idealism. So we want to help people, but they create a uh, they create a, a construct where it keeps people impoverished. So our our federal policy is to keep you poor and keep you single and not <laughs> and not keep families together. That's our federal social safety net is make sure that the family's fragmented and keep them poor, and then we'll help you. There's nothing in our social safety net that says if you try to work together as a team and you try to elevate yourself, we're going to help you phase your way up and out. Mm -hmm. You get to $12 an hour, they take everything. Well, Instead of just letting you maintain your benefits and work you out to the point where you actually have not only a living wage, but you're succeeding. 
Sure. And so it makes no sense that we have a barrier to prevent you from taking that next step to be successful. Well, and that was my, my next question prior to the bill. What was what was the intent for th that barrier, that $600, that $600 stop point? Well, why, 1960, why? I'm sure uh, okay. it was a lot of money. So. <laughs> well, for them, yeah, yeah right. for anybody at right. that point in time. Right. But for, for now, you're right. That's right. Poverty level. Uh, and well, it's below that. It's not even poverty level. So I don't. I couldn't live on six hundred dollars a month. No. And nor does anybody that I know. Well, no one should. And no one should. Correct. Uh, especially again, we, we, as we said earlier, people who want to work. These, this is, we're not making them work. We're not. We're not telling them you must. These are people who want to work. And now with this bill, they're able to actually progress in life. Correct. I mean, the, the nice part of it is so the way that the way the legislation works is that you can you can work, you can um, family members can put money away for you. So if you have a Down syndrome child, you can mm. put money away into the account, just similar to a, a college 529. Okay. So it works similarly for, as far as the gifting allowances and limits. Uh, once they once a hundred thousand dollars, that's the threshold. Then okay. your Social Security benefit that you receive disappears. Okay. Only during the month in which the account is over a hundred thousand. If it dips below it, it resumes the following month. Right. So cap, you're never penalized on that? You're not penalized. The cap on the account is the same as the regular 529s, which okay. current law is 414000 So it allows families to put money in there. So imagine if you have a, a child who has the ability to live on their own. Mm -hmm. They can live in a home, but they don't, have, uh, you know, they don't have the ability to do all the other things that come with that, right? Water heater goes out. Well, under current law, you, don't have, you can't save the money to repair to your repair it. water. Correct. Now, with, once the ABLE law is... Uh, the law of Ohio, which will be 90 days since the governor signed it here. So about in this fall, it'll be law. Okay. And the accounts will be available uh, according to the treasurer for January 1. Okay. So on January 1, you can put money away. And guess what? You, that, doesn't get, that doesn't count against you, and you can repair your hot water heater. And right? everything's in... And you can move on with life, and you can still maintain a job, and you can work. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing. And be thing. an active member of the yeah. Ohio people. Yeah, a, active member of the of, of the economy, active member of the community, and you don't have to live in the sh in the poverty shadows as as we've relegated them in the past. It's wonderful. And and again, with with a pass something with a passage like that, again, it, not not a lot of discord amongst anybody. It went bipartisan bipartisanly. It was unanimous. It, Unanimous, both Isn't chambers. Isn't that great? It's, it's wonderful, right, it's wonderful. Do you feel that there's going to be a companion to this as, as you're looking forward to? We are to looking at other things. Uh, part, of, uh, you know, part of working within the disability space is uh, we're waiting on the United States Treasury to issue some regulations on how these accounts are gonna work. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see the regulations address the work issue so that they can work and they can do a direct deposit into the account. Okay. So we're not sure what the regulations are gonna look like, so we're looking for workforce development opportunities to tag along with the ABLE account. So now that we have this in place, we have a place to put the money that they would earn um, in a safe, tax-free way, mm -hmm. which allows them to you know, maintain their benefits but also be productive. So we're not sure yet what the Treasury regulations are going to do and or what the State Treasury is going to do with, with their rules and their regulations. So once we see that kind of unfold between now and January, then we'll have a better idea on what we're going to do next. Okay. Well Baby steps, and, and look, yes, where, look where we are. Yes, sir. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Um, again, talking about better, bettering people, we're talking about education, mm -hmm. which I know is a, a key point in, in a lot of the, what you do up at the State House. Um, one of the items that is going forward that was mentioned in the, um, the governor's the, um, budget was also the, tax, uh, the freeze for college tuition. Your, your thoughts there again uh, we're, we're I'm, a, I'm a little torn I, okay. you know I mean uh, this is one of these things that's uh, is tough I mean I'm, I'm 42 when I was in college which was not that long ago I know most in college <laughs> will think I'm super old but it was $750 a quarter at UC so for $2,500 books everything I got through I worked right. two three jobs I paid my way through UC it was not a problem and and so I you know I can, uh, that's on one hand you know I would right. like to see that four-year option um, I'd like to see that possible again. I'd like to be able I'd like to see kids be able to go to school, work one or two jobs and pay their way through an undergraduate degree in four to five years like I did. Um, I think that's important and it should always be there. Uh, and now if you want to go to Ivy League schools and you're willing to pay for that, then that's a different thing. But you should be able to go to UC or Ohio State and pay your way through. And so we have to have longer term discussions on uh, cost of education, especially a public education. It, to me, it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense that we're pricing ourselves to a point where it, we're making it unaffordable. Um, it makes more sense to go down to Great Oaks and, and get a degree in welding, and six months later you can be making a hundred to one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year as a pipe fitter, right? Or you can go get one hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of debt and make twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year. So. 
there's that as well. Do, do you think that has caused, could, could quite possibly cause more of a detriment than it has a, a help to the state? Um, by doing something like this again, because you bring up the uh, the perfect idea. Not that there's anything wrong with vocational work and, and vocational schools, but for those wanting to excel sure. in their skills. And sure. again, you know, we we both went through four years. We yeah, went again, through four they, years, and then another two. going to say you went three, a little right? bit further than I right. did, and, but I understand. I mean, yeah. but but we made it. Right. I, well, everybody. Ha I think the issue is having the flexibility in education. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, the the. The education is going to follow the economy and the jobs, mm -hmm. and there's always going to be a need for people who are college educated. There's always going to be a need for people with master's degrees and professional degrees. It'll always be there. Right. Um, but what we don't want to do is create an environment where you get that education and you spend the rest of your life in debt and subject to paying those bills, right? And, and without having the opportunity to have the freedom associated with the education, which is the entire point. Exactly. And we definitely have, um, you know, a need for a lot of vocational and skilled training and skilled jobs around the state. We don't have them, we're lacking in them. Uh, most of the builders and contractors you talk to can't find the journeymen and the tradesmen to do the work that they need. And these are jobs that pay between 80 and $120,000 a year. Um, you talk to some of the car dealers in the area, you know, the performance auto folks, and they'll tell you that, uh, you know, they've got five, six openings at each location for mechanics that have computer skills and know how to computer program. And these are jobs that pay 100 to 150000 a year. Yet they're, they're left unopened. And they're, they're, and, and they're, they're open. And they're open. And so I think part of it is making sure that whatever we do from an education perspective is encourage, you know, my job's not to tell educators no. what to do. My job is to help them. Um, you know, with the funding and, and, and making sure that they have the resources they need to be successful, but also to have a conversation about what we need economically for the state and to make sure that somebody is providing for that. Do you think with this, this freeze is also, you know, we, we, we brought up before that we're not seeing people stay. Yeah. You, you may have come to Ohio State, you had a good time, regardless yeah. of if you enjoyed studying or the other activities that went along with it. Or you went to a smaller school or what have you, but you know what? The minute you graduated, you said goodbye to you as a Buckeye, and you went. That's right. You went elsewhere. Yeah, we still have a net migration loss. That's yeah. correct. Uh, what's going to be that that target, that sweet spot to that enticement? Because again, as we're talking here, this is not much of an enticement. No, no. I, I you know, freezing tuition is not an enticement to keep people people no. in the state of Ohio. Let's be honest. The the trick is making sure that we have the the types of jobs that people want here. And I've been a big advocate for that for a long time. I mean, we used to be the center of innovation for the entire country. Exactly. The state developed everything. If it was technologically innovative, the state did it, the state built it, the state manufactured it, produced it, and sold it. And we need to get back to that. And quite frankly, we've, we've allowed all this stuff to go to Texas and the Carolinas and California, and that's where the innovation has gone in the last 15 years. Sure. And we need to recapture that. And part of that is, um, you know, tax policy. Part of that is the the business policies that we put forward. Um, but also, you know, quite frankly, I'm biased. We don't. I like I like Ohio, mm -hmm. even though there's not a beach and there's not any <laughs> mountains. Um, I like Ohio. It's a wonderful place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. The people are friendly. It's it, it's the best in, in my mind. And we need to do a better job of selling our state to these companies and to these entrepreneurs. But we also need to do some business reforms, which are some of the things I'm working on is comprehensive business reform to create the, the corporate structures mm -hmm. that would allow the, the tech companies to stay here and start here. Um, part of the reason why they're not here is Ohioans aren't used to the in types of uh, those types of businesses as uh, from an investor standpoint. Number one, we're not used to it from an educational standpoint. We're not used to supporting it, right? So it, we it have to create like that environment. It sounds like we're still a little old school, so to speak. We, we you know, that's right. that's them Californians over there. That, well, we it, like making our cars. We like sure, making we our do. machine tools. We like ma we like making things we can put our hands on. And yes. and that's that's what Ohio has always been good at. Um, but there's no there's nothing wrong with uh, bringing an Apple here to Ohio and then manufacturing the or assembling the iPads in one of these factories that that we've been trying to find a use for. So those are some of the things that we need to start encouraging. I, I think you, and I, I think this just popped in my head, you know, how, how we have taken a while to embrace something, but, but it, it happened. Uh, Honda, mm -hmm. that took us forever to kind of think, do we need it? Should we have it? It came in. Uh, you know, right. so now we're starting to some, see some of the things, the green initiative that we're like, right. well, I don't know. We can make right. some parts for it. I don't know if we want it. And now we're starting to slowly see it. Do you, do you think that's part 
in, well, in parcels of Ohioans or are, Ohioans typically we uh, we're like we're slow to change. We 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 like to vote that way on election <laughs> day, um, but we're typically slow to change. I mean, we we stick with what we know um, mm -hmm. and things that have been proven to work. Um, but in you know moving forward in the new technologies and the new economy. Um, we're going to have to embrace a different way of doing things, and we have to create the business climate for it. Sure. That's the first and foremost. If you can go to California and you have, uh, you know, laws that allow you to do investor things without fear of uh, of someone suing you or or the litigation or or some sort of uh, you know maybe there's a, an adjustment we need to make to our criminal statute to encourage people to invest without fear of a, a violation of some technical law. Um, those are things we need to look at and understand why we're different and why we're ha not getting these types of businesses in Ohio. Excuse me. You had made mention of, of um, a little bit of the red tape that that it, that is there, and that you're kind of you're currently looking at provisions that could possibly help. Is there anything that we can talk about that you you might be able to? Well, sure. Um, you know, we're meeting with the bar association on a regular basis. Uh, the bar association and I have come to the conclusion that we need to rewrite our our corporate laws from the limited liability statute perspective. Mm -hmm. And for those that are watching, this is the law that covers basically 95 to 98 percent of all startups. Okay. So if you go out and you start a, you know, a, a coffee shop or you start an internet company, you're going to use that statute. Got it. And it's outdated. It hasn't been looked at for 30, 40 years, and it doesn't meet the needs of, of what we need it to do today. So we're going to work from, we're going to rewrite the whole section. Um, we're working on that now, moving into the fall with the hope of having a bill by the first of the year. Uh, we're working on reforming our foreclosure laws top to bottom, making sure that if you buy a house in Ohio, you have some property rights. Uh, resetting the law so that the errors that were made during the too big to fail era um, are wiped out and so we can go back to some sort of certainty. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. If you're coming to Ohio for a job, you want to know that you have some property rights again and, sure. and have some security. And at the same time, if you're a creditor and you want to lend money in Ohio, we need to make sure that your property and, and the collateral that you've lent money on is secured and there's a simple, easy process uh, to get paid back in the event of a default. So there needs to be balance in the system again and right now we're just out of balance. You had said that it was about 40, 30, 40 years out of date. If you kind of look at that, that's kind of moving us into our generation that we're making right. the, the changes. It, True. Do you think it was something that maybe it needed a, a fresh generation's eyes to look at and say, you know what, this is what needs to be done? Or was it something that should have been done, again, even further back? I, I think all these things require a new set of eyes occasionally. Um, you know, I came with a whole new set of ideas. I ran on these things. You know, sure. I ran on foreclosure reform. I ran on school funding reform. Uh, I ran on uh, re rewriting the business statutes so we can get mom and pop businesses started in Ohio easily and simpler. So these are all things that I ran on that I'm working on. And it was basically just going out talking to people, knocking on a lot of doors. Uh, you know, when you, when you hit 100 plus thousand doors and you talk to a lot of business owners and you listen to what they actually want and need, there's universal themes start uh, coming around and then you do your research and your homework and you find out what the real issue is. And quite frankly, the, the issues are not complicated. The solution is because we have 40-year established ways of doing things. But when you ask the right questions and uh, you go to the best and the smartest and the brightest in the state and you say, okay, well, here's the issue. Here's my take on it. What do you think? When they come back to you and say, yes, we need to redo this, then that's, a, that's encouraging that at least sure. we got it right. And you know the 28th House District was responsive, and we're getting a chance to change the way Ohio is going to work in the future. So that's really neat. It sounds as if, again, with the new set of eyes, that there is also the willingness to change now. It sounds like we've had people on for many years now that you, you look and go, there was never going to be a budge in a certain area or a certain house district or what have you. And now we're starting to see that happen. Is, is it, again, the changing of the guard, so to speak? <laughs> you know, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's always been my... Um, objective to try to find, um, you know, my, my grandfather was an engineer for Melicron and uh, he was the guy that built the clean room and figured out how to carve plutonium for the bomb for okay. Melicron. There we and, go. <laughs> and so I kind of inherited, although I'm not an engineer, I kind of inherited <laughs> his ability to dissect a problem and come up with a solution. And so when I look at what's going on, a lot of times we get uh, newspaper feeds or we get the Facebook feeds that tell us what the problems are, mm -hmm. but not all of them are identifying what the true issue is and they're feeding information based on what we want to hear and not based on what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always focused on what we need to do and, and I don't care where the idea comes from. It doesn't matter whether it comes from a Democrat or Republican, someone who's an independent person, it, it doesn't matter. The, if there's a pain point and it's a common pain point, then we need to work together on it.
And it's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. It's a common sense issue. It's something that we need to do as Ohioans. And I think part of the problem is that, you know, come election time, everything gets spliced up into 30 second sound bites. Yeah. And it's not based <clears throat> on truth anymore. It's not based on what's right or what we need. It's based on someone trying to get into office. And I just don't campaign that way, and I don't, and I don't believe that we should govern that way. I think we should govern in a way that uh, identifies the issue, mm -hmm. where we can find common solutions. And um, you know, I'm very proud to say that all of the, every single bill that I've introduced, I think we're at 10 or 12 now, plus the four that's gotten through the House, right. they're all bipartisan. Um, and the reason why is because I'm finding common pain points and I'm reaching out, trying to get the diversity of opinion mm -hmm. on the cause and effect. And uh, you know, I always like to say, if, if we're going to go to Columbus, you know, everybody says, "Well, 71 is the quickest way." <laughs> but if the bridge collapses, what happens? What are you going to do? Are you exactly. going to sit there for 10 years until they rebuild it, or are you going to find a way around it? And I think in government, a lot of times they just sit there and wait for 10 years. Fair, and not realize that there's another way around. That's right. But that's fair. Well, things that we have, we've been talking about bill passage and and making those achievements, and and you have uh, House Bill 74. Yeah. Is one of those achievements as well, and this is uh, uh, to revise the state assessments and examinations given to Ohio students. Uh, again, going back to our education point, yeah. we've kind of made a couple circles around here on this. Um, we've kind of the state of Ohio has always been a one-stop shop when it came came to schools. Here's the test: this you must pass. Yeah. That school's great, it's gold star for you. Right. Bad check for you. You didn't pass this section. This is going to make those changes to make things That's a little more encompassed. That's our hope. What, what was your initial thought when, when constructing 74? Uh, I, I think 74, again, is one of those, it, it leaps in the right way. Um, but again, um, there's been, so much has happened with, with the uh, park tests and, and the testing that we've put ourselves into mm -hmm. that we really don't know if this is going to be the, the end solution. I, you know, personally, um, I find it interesting that uh, if you go back 200 years or 100 years, it was just one person with a piece of paper and a pen, like what you're holding in your hand, or you know, or <laughs> ink and parchment. Sure. And uh, you know, the, by the time you're seven or eight years old, you probably knew more than most college graduates today, because there was one person who worked with you in real time and gave you real feedback and provided you that education. And typically, they had two books. You know, back then it was maybe one book on law and a Bible, and that was about that it. it. And they might get a newspaper occasionally, once a month, once a quarter, whatever, or whatever they could scrounge up. But that was it, and it was very basic and very simple, and they focused on reading, writing, math, and uh, you know, they learned some engineering, they learned how to build things, and that's why when they were 16, they could go out, build their own house, create their own farm, and be successful at 16. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. Correct, <laughs> right. So I think um, you know, everything that we do needs to get more and more back into that kind of a model, which means that real-time feedback, um, you know, personal interactions with students. Mm -hmm. We all know that no two people learn the same way. We this know is that. True. And so when we use one test to determine whether you get a gold star, as you said, or a yeah. smiley face, then we're setting up a lot of the kids for failure. And it doesn't mean that those kids don't have the ability or the means to learn. It means that we are not, we're trying to do the same thing that Henry Ford did to the automobile, and that's create a factory line assembly. Right. And quite frankly, that's what we did with the Industrial Revolution, is we went away from that schoolhouse mom and dad model mm -hmm. to an assembly line process because all the families went to the cities to work. And that's so true. that's what we did, is we decided, well, if it's good enough to make cars and products, it's good enough to educate our kids. And we made that change. And you know what? We haven't made a change since. And so it's been 120, 130 years, years of teaching kids the same way. And quite frankly, you know, everything else has changed except for that. And so we need to be realistic about it and make the adjustments necessary for the kids, period. And so I think 74 is a step in that direction. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the end all be all. There's a lot more that we need to do to get back to that original model of closer one on one, real interactive education and feedback. Um, there's a lot of good programs. Wint Woods has got a good one uh, with their global the studies. Global studies, exactly. It's a very good program where they're doing that. Um, there's some good software out there that I've seen. Um, that uh, one of the senators from uh, Utah, Senator Stevenson, has been pushing. And what that does is provides real-time feedback. And kids that are using it in kindergarten and first grade are three and four years ahead of their contemporaries when they use it. Gives real feedback, real interactive feedback that uh, an individual would be able to give you on your reading and your writing and your math. And so those are some s skill sets and some tools that we need to look at moving forward with our kids. And it's not about spending money. It's about r using the money we have wisely mm -hmm. to get those results. Kind of playing the, the devil's advocate because I think people probably have, who have watched the show probably know my stance on where things go when it comes to small versus large. And it's not because of my stature only. <laughs> but um, 
looking at things like the online schooling and and yeah. the the progression that's slowly happening in in varying um, districts, are we are we going to unfortunately shy away from some of that where kids are going to go? I can excel further on an online program and at my own pa pace, but I'm hearing this new component of, of, of feedback, which is something I don't think I've ever heard when it came to some of these. Yeah. Or is it going to hold somebody back and go, well, I've already gone through that course in three weeks because I, I can, and I can kick back and do whatever. Well, I think that's part and parcel of, of the whole problem. Um, and that's why I said again, you know, one, one type of education isn't, isn't always going to work for somebody else. Fair. Um, you know, you might be able to do an online course and you get it done and maybe you're self-motivated and you keep moving and pushing yourself because that's who you are. And then there's other folks that, right, they're going to, they do the course and they're like, okay, I'm done and now I have summer break in the fall. Right. And so there are, there are different personality types and I think then, you know, that's where education needs to have the flexibility to meet the needs of the individual student. Um, of course, again, playing the advocate with with bringing in um, the goal sounds like with the feedback, it sounds like we would like to bring it back to a smaller class size, which obviously means more funding for teachers because we're going to need more teachers, which we may or may not have. Do you think you're going to find a little more resistance if that's eventually what's going to be needed? Well, to be perfectly honest, we just provided more funding for education than, than the entire history of Ohio in this budget. So, I mean, there's even with the governor's cut, there's more money in education than ever before in the history of Ohio. So, you know, funding I don't think is the issue. I okay. think what it is, is is looking at those kind of those other models and, you know, Utah is using this as a, I, I like their example, I'm still studying it, trying to figure out if it's working for them, mm -hmm. as they say, but they're indicating that, you know, they're using these interactive uh, programs alongside the teachers in the classroom as a way of reinforcing the skills and getting that real-time feedback. Because quite honestly, you know, both my boys are in public school, there's one teacher, there's 20 kids. Yeah. And if you're going to really try to get to the point where you can do the one-on-one, -on -one, you need to get it down to at least 10 if we're going to be realistic somewhere in that, na in mm -hmm. that neighborhood. And so if we can find a way to leverage technologies that provide the same opportunities to the kids as having additional teachers, then let's do that. It's not a very costly proposition to do that right now. Um, where we're going to find the funds to add more layers, a lot of that's going to be at the local level too. I mean, we're going to have to call, call out for efficiencies and effectiveness in our, in our processes and find ways to, to cut costs. I mean, businesses do it every day. Every year I go through a process where I say, okay, well, how can I save money, right? Mm -hmm. So that means I look at my phone services, I look at my internet service provider, I look at all of those things to find ways of cutting costs every single year, and I do it just as a matter of habit because, quite honestly, I'd much rather pay someone a little bit more um, or maybe I need to you know, upgrade my technology so I can provide services better to my clients. And so those are things that I do. And I think um, in government, it kind of we don't think that way enough. Mm -hmm. um, there are some good folks out there that do that. Um, there's some good folks at Sycamore Schools, as an example, that do that. Um, they've held their spending to 0.3% a year for a 10-year period of time, so a 3% total over 10. And so when other schools say they can't do that, I point to them and say, well, here's an example of a, of a system <laughs> who, has, who has not only done it, but has also increased student performance over that same period of time and who's you know, gotten some national recognition for the, the students that have come out of there for their academic achievement. So you can do both. It's possible. We've seen it. So the question is how to do it and how, mm -hmm. do, how do we do it based on the neighborhoods and the communities that you're dealing with. And you know, Sycamore has a different demographic than, than Cincinnati Public or Wenton Woods, and so we have to be cognizant of the fact that demographics matter. Sure. Uh, socioeconomics matter. You know, whether or not you have a single or two-parent household makes a difference on, on education, and it may mean that that mom or dad is working two, three jobs and just isn't there to help them with their homework at night. Mm -hmm. And those are the types of things that uh, we have to look at long term, and we have to figure out how to fund it and make things efficient in the process to find the extra funds. You made a mention of a comment, and, and it's been in an article, and it's we've said it a few times here today. Common sense. Everything it revolves around the idea of hopefully moving forward in a common sense means. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that that's what you're seeing in the state house, uh, or are you finding that that that's best practices for your district or, I, and for you? And you know, in I, I think our district is. Uh, is unique. It, it really is. It's um, it's it's highly diverse. It, it, it's a good reflection of the entire state. Uh, I mean, think about it. Between Wenton Woods and Princeton, we have 40 different languages spoken in high school. There. I mean, <laughs> it, that's highly diverse community. Yeah. Uh, the socioeconomics are all over the place. We have people that live in multi-million dollar homes all the way down to a, you know a ten twenty thousand dollar house. I mean, it's it's really a good reflection of the state. 
And I think because of that, we end up getting, I get the best feedback. So when I talk to my superintendents quarterly, uh, we sit down with them every quarter and say, okay, well, what are your issues? What are you fighting? What are you struggling against? And I reach out to the school board members and do the same thing and try to find what their issues are. And quite frankly, they're, they're very good people and they all know each other and they all work together. Um, and it makes my job a heck of a lot easier because I have a lot of good folks that I can go talk to. So I think that, you know, to, to answer your question, I think it, it depends on your district, depends <laughs> on your feedback, but we're very lucky here. Uh, Hamilton County is very fortunate. The 28th is exceptionally fortunate in my mind. Um, it's very diverse, not only uh, from, from its population, but also politically diverse, which is healthy. Sure. And it makes us all listen and talk to each other and work together to solve problems. Well, it sounds like we're, we're getting there in the right direction with everything that we've talked about. And then, of course, before we start wrapping things up, unfortunately, um, a lot of bills come out of, of tragedy and, they do. And, and the unfortunate uh, means. Uh, granted, this bill that we're going to start talking about uh, is not necessarily born out of a, a recent tragedy, but uh, the unfolding of a recent tragedy has yeah. kind of moved this forward. And you're working on a bill currently That's uh, for, uh, for gun control. Uh, well, it's not gun control. It's, but, it's uh, officer-involved shootings is the, is, yes. the, is the topic. I mean, you know, Cincinnati, we're not strangers to this issue. We've, unfortunately not. We're, unfortunately not. We've been battling it and trying to deal with it for uh, decades. And the last time this happened in early 2000s, you know, out of that birth, a wonderful collaborative process that um, Cincinnati can be proud of, and that's the the cooperation with law enforcement and the communities. And mm -hmm. we've been, we've done a very good job locally figuring it out. Uh, nationally, it's it's a tragedy, and I think there's a couple of reasons for it. But the bill itself um, requires uh, transparency. Number one, okay. um, it requires some independent review of the investigation process. And, uh, and it requires that the prosecuting attorney disclose the into all the information that's subject uh, to disclosure under the, under the applicable law mm -hmm. within 72 hours after the investigation concludes. So if they choose to indict or not to indict, then that information becomes available. And I think if you look at the recent events that just occurred, that was the process that they followed and it worked. And I'm glad that uh, they followed that process. And so our bill, uh, we've been working on it since I got there in January, I think about the second week. Okay. And we've met with law enforcement, prosecuting attorneys, the, and their associations, and uh, we should have something ready to go. We've worked through the details on how it's going to work, uh, but we should have something to drop here within the next week or two. Seeing uh, someone actually follow what's very similar to a bill that you're uh, proposing, uh, yeah. do you find that is, is refreshing to know that you are moving in a, in a proper direction that's going to uh, expedite? items and, and again shine that light yeah. upon the entire situation yeah I think the transparency is huge but I mean quite honestly if we're gonna really tackle this long term I mean, this is a this is step one in my mind is okay. allowing the families and the community members to see what happened and mm -hmm. having that transparency is huge but quite honestly we have to start looking at how we fund government when we're asking law enforcement to be our tax collectors we have a problem and all of this is is uh, basically occurring for those reasons. I mean, you know, this that one gentleman got pulled over for failure to display a front license plate. Correct. You know, someone else for improper turn signal, right? Yeah. And someone dies because of that. Um, just the other day, there was a, a, two kids in a drive through at a Hardee's that got shot yeah. over, you know, an officer saying stop the car and he didn't hear him and the passenger got killed and the driver was the one uh, who didn't hear him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were in a drive through going from, it, it's just nonsense. So I think part of this is we have to look at how we fund our law, you know, how we fund law enforcement, how we fund local government, how we fund our jails. And if we're asking police officers to do the job of a legislature, I mean, mm -hmm. my job is to figure out how to pay for things. Right. And if we are shirking on our responsibilities and asking law enforcement to provide the revenue to pay for these things, we have, we're going to continue to see this. So we need to look at that again and figure out how we can put law enforcement back in, into a position where they're not the chief tax collector at the local level. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and most officers don't like the fact that they have to, they have to do this either. So, um, and, and it's not, I'm not picking on officers. I think, you know, yeah. it's a tough job that they have and they've got to balance that. But when they're being told that they have to, you know, find ways of raising revenue for their department or for the courthouse, we need to examine that. And I think you get some bad unintended consequences and a lot of distrust as a result. But don't you find that the, the biggest question when it comes to this issue is why? Why being the public going, why did this happen? Yeah. You have the, um, the officers asking, why am, I why am I doing this? Or why am I supposed to do this? Right. And then we have to ask, why did this? What, why can't we stop it? 
Yeah, a lot of questions. Sure. Um, uh, do you, do you find that this may at least ease minds to kind of start to answer those questions and again break down that wall? Yeah, I, th I think part of this is we have to have a serious look at what do we want our law enforcement officers to do. Quite frankly, I want them to protect and serve. I don't want them to be out there collecting That's revenue the for local government. Right. That's what they're supposed. That's to, their that's, motto: is yeah. protect and serve, not be, uh, not to be the tax collector, mm -hmm. and uh, that's part of the problem. And when you look at some of these some of these communities, their chief method of funding their government is through issuing tickets for secondary offenses, um, and pancaking charges on folks. And let's let's be honest: um, the the people that get hit the worst with that are not your. It, it's your. It's typically your poor. They're the ones that get hit with this, sure. and so it's another regressive tax in a way on on those that are economically disadvantaged, and they don't have the ability to hire a lawyer to get out of it or to to clean their record up, and they end up paying and paying and paying, and they get stuck in a cycle, and then they can't make the payment, and then they get stuck again and again and again. Or and they don't return into society. Uh, sometimes, sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. So I think we have to have a real conversation about, um, you know, how how are we going to fund local government? Are we going to mandate that law enforcement be the tax collector? Um, and you know, quite frankly, it was part of parcel with the transportation budget when it came out. I said, "There's this huge distracted driving piece in here. We got to pull it out." And the leadership looked at me and said, "Why?" I said, "Well, have you noticed that there's a, a line here that says this is how much money we're going to generate from it?" I said, "So what we're asking is law enforcement to collect our money for us to pay for bridges and roads and mm -hmm. infrastructure." And I said, "That's fundamentally wrong." And, and if, as a legislature, if we need money for bro roads and bridges, then we have to have the ability and the desire and the willingness to go back to our community and say, you want this road fixed, you want these bridges fixed, it's going to cost some money, how do you want us to collect it? And let the, let the voters decide how they want to deal with it. So as a legislator, it's our job to determine these things. It's not our job to pass the buck onto somebody else uh, to do our job. That's fair. I think the, the other thing that was coming through my mind as well is that the shift that we've made in law enforcement has also made them become more of the monster that they they are feared mm -hmm. uh, and they and in some re regards as things like what has happened most recent and, and and continuing is that they lose respect at it too because well yeah oh, they're gonna, this is what's going to happen and, and and so we get that dic dichotomy of well, this is what they're going to end up doing anyway, and why should I believe it? Should we not bring to the table the idea that they are to serve and protect, and there should be no fear, that that's what they're doing. They're going to protect me from what is the wrongs of what's going on. Well, and I think the, then the flip side of it, too, is that what ends up happening is that because there's that fear, then you start seeing that backlash against law Correct. enforcement. And we see, um, you know, like Officer Kim, uh, who was... Who was a, Quite honestly, he was assassinated. He was killed yes. intentionally um, because that's what that guy wanted to do. He wanted to kill an officer for no reason other than he just wanted to, and that's the backlash. And uh, you know, I don't want I don't want uh, people who've made law enforcement. You know, I don't want them to go out to work and their family worry about them coming home at night. You know, I, I, that's that's not what we need anymore. We we need to have a real good conversation about how law enforcement is going to become part of the community again. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you knew your beat cop, you knew the guy it's on true. the street. Yeah. You, you know, he was your friend. He was someone you could go to and, you know, if, if uh, and, he, and then he knew you and if he saw you doing something silly, he could say, hey, you know what, don't do that, go home instead of writing you 15 tickets. And again, and I think we need to get back more to that kind of a model somehow. It's better for the officers, I think, their safety, mm -hmm. but it's better also for the community and rebuild that trust and that relationship, which is really what it's supposed to be about in the first place. And, and we've got to figure out how to get there. I don't know how we can do it yet. And again, you're removing that paperwork because, you know, 8 million tickets are, again, exaggeration here, I get that, but you've got that. As tickets pile, then it becomes more of a, a process. Now you're either spending jail time or it could be even worse. And then as a backlash, as you said, continues, it could get worse from it, on either end. And you shouldn't be fearful to go to somebody who's supposed to serve and protect you. Right, I think that's kind of the, the challenge that we have. And you go to other communities where, um, you know, they tend to be wealthier and the police officers tend to know everybody and mm -hmm. you get more of that model. You know, when you go to uh, places that struggle economically, you kind of tend to get some of the other models. And so we really need to start thinking about it and how we're gonna do it and have those meetings and, you know, bring law enforcement community together to have those conversations to figure out how we move forward. 
And as a legislature, we have to make a policy to shift mm -hmm. uh, saying that, you know, when we're going to fund these things, we're going to fund them, and we're not going to ask you to go arrest people to fund your, your local government. And I think that's, that's part and parcel of the issue is, you know, the tickets and the fees and the costs, uh, those things fund these things. And we need to have a conversation about it. And it's, it's going to be a big one, mm -hmm. and it's going to be challenging, and it's going to be tough. And, um, you know, it's going to be, there will be a lot of rhetoric, uh, political rhetoric that will fly both ways on it. But it's something that needs to be, be discussed, and Republicans, Democrats both need to come together and talk about it in a meaningful and productive way. Um, and we need law enforcement at the table leading the charge on the conversation, as well as the communities. And I think if we can do that in a, in a way that makes sense, then we'll get better policy at, at the end, and we're going to get, uh, you know, we're going to have police that, that uh, will be respected and trusted and liked, mm -hmm. and, they're, and, and not above reproach. And, Right now, no one seems to be trusting anything either side saying, yeah. and that's not good for anybody, and that's not good for the citizens, not good for law enforcement. Um, it puts uh, the guys who wear blue uh, their lives on the line, and there's mm -hmm. going to be more retribution as the anger and resentment builds and more people looking to take out police officers, and that's not acceptable either. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, um, we have to find a way to you know, protect and preserve the peace, but also make sure that our police feel confident and safe when they go out and do their job. Um, but also have the citizens feel like they can count on them as a friend and a partner to make their neighborhoods uh, the place that they want it to be. That makes all sense to me, and I'm hoping that everybody else will understand as well. And we will look forward to talking about this at another time as this continues, because yeah. believe it or not, we've made it to the top of our hour. Wow. The, the hour goes, goes so, by. It goes very, very it quickly. It does go you. quickly. But I do want to make sure that everybody gets the opportunity, if they need to, uh, to speak with you even further, of course, before our next visit here at the Roundtable, sure. you can always get information to Mr. Deaver at any time. You can get the information up on the screen. You can either write him at the uh, snail mail address above at 77 South High Street on the 11th floor in Columbus at 43215, or give him a call at 614-466-8120, or email at rep28 at ohiohouse.gov. And the, e uh, the website address is at the bottom. We were talking about the website earlier. You can do it as the direct URL, or there is a drop box to say your, your district, or you can go by zip code. So we've made it again to the bottom of the top thank or bottom much. of the hour, whichever you want to call it. But I want to thank you for an enjoyable yeah. 60 minutes here on the Columbus Report. And I look forward to having you back on here as well. Thank you much. Appreciate Not it. Not a problem. Yep. Thank you yeah, as well. You. I want to thank you for joining us as well. If you found this enjoyable, exciting, and of course informative, we encourage you to continue watching every month, as well as getting involved. Community involvement is important, and we are a community-involved area here. Volunteers are needed. If you'd like to help us out on any of our productions or would like to create something of your own, call the phone number right at the bottom of the screen, 825-2429. That's our number here. We'll gladly knowing I'll probably answer the phone and help you and guide you in whatever means you need. If I'm not out behind the phone, I'm here behind the desk at the round table here on the Columbus Report giving you all the information you need to know about your district today, of course the 28th district. Hope you have a great evening and we'll see you again next time.